is to uh, present myself tonight to you as a person who would uh, uh, who would like to do as much as I can for each of you and serve you well. Uh, I went to, I grew up in Swapska, graduated from the University of Virginia and Boston University's Law School, practiced law for 30 years as a part of the firm of Arthur and Morse in Danvers, and continued on there with uh, as all counsel for another eight years. So that's who I am. What here? All right, thank you. We're going to start with the questions, and as I said before, these questions have been uh, given to the candidates in advance, so they know how they will be answered. And we will start with J.R. Colby. The question is: What's your position on building a new town hall and police station? And if you're in favor of it, where do you think it should be located? I'm in favor of a new town hall. Um, the times come, especially with the situation in the police station. Um, they've been operating on a very cramped quarters in what has become unsanitary quarters. My position on town hall is: I think we should revamp the existing town hall, and I think we should build a conservative, a conservatively sized, separate police station on Morgan Ave. and put both of them to sewer. Having two facilities is going to keep us from having all our eggs in one basket in case of fire, mold, mechanical failure, or other things that we've seen in town facilities in the past. Um, in the instance of the police station, it'll be safer with a separate police station in case of some type of violent incident, which is becoming more and more common these days. Also, anyone who's visited the police station realizes that there are some privacy issues, especially the victims. There's no privacy in the police station right now. You walk in, you're under everyone's scrutiny that's in town hall, whoever happens to be standing in the lobby, and um, I think by revamping the town hall, putting an addition on it, it may help keep us from having to meet every single bit of code in the code book. And it's also our historical center of town government, which I think is important to maintain. Okay, thank you. If I can take a minute, John. If, some, if anyone is parked next door at the liquor store, you need to move your car. <clears throat> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Mike Doyle. Okay. Uh, I've been on the Municipal Building Committee for the last few years, and we've taken this uh, subject to task. We've looked at um, three alternatives for sites. We've looked at the Governor Dumas site, we looked at the JRM site, and we're currently looking at the police station site, which JR just mentioned. However, that site is probably not an option because the police department, the fire department came to us with three stipulations to sell that building. They said if we're going to sell that land, they wanted storage hookup in the city of Newport basically said no to that uh, option because of the uh, functional hall. They also wanted to have parking, okay, and chair parking, and that's basically not a deal breaker, but it's going to be a difficult thing to take on. Having said that, I think we have to do a building at, at the current site. The planning board, the conservation board, we all got together in November, and it was recommended that the town government site is where it is. So we decided that's the location. Looking at a 50-year outlook for the town, one building done properly, done now, will solve all the issues if it's in one building. Um, it's, it's a little bit more money in the long run, but instead of doing two separate buildings, it's financially more feasible to do one building. It was discussed last night at the selectors meeting of this option. Um, I hope that we, as selectors, we can get out to the town and educate the people on how, how important this is because just in the last eight weeks we've had two septic breaks in the police station and they just can't live in that environment anymore. So if it doesn't, if it doesn't pass, we're going to have to do something anyway. So I'm just trying to think we, I think we do it once, we do it right, I think it's best for the town. Okay. Thank you. George Morris. Uh, yes, the uh, police station has been determined to be in deplorable conditions. And I don't know whether any of you had a chance to tour the police station when it was opened up for tours. But if you didn't, just know that it's a place where you wouldn't want to work, certainly wouldn't want to live, uh, because it's just almost uninhabitable. Uh, I think the building inspector could very easily go down there and put a sticker on it and say you can't use it anymore. So in the best interest of the police department, these fellows deserve a place that's in much better shape, something that's usable, can be certifiable, because these are professional officers, they study very hard and work very hard to become good police officers for the town. 
and we would like to retain them. As a practical matter, if they're not allowed to work in decent conditions, they will leave. And it's just, we're a training ground for other departments, frankly. Uh, the town hall, I've been in other town halls so many times. Every time I walk in, I get congested. And that's because there's so much mold in the basement. Uh, it seeps up through the floors. And I know other people are affected the same way. It's cramped. There's no privacy at all. Uh, the meeting room is used for so many things and sometimes for two meetings at once. It's a little difficult because I've been there for one meeting, somebody else is working there too. Uh, extremely difficult. And again, these are good people who work hard for the town and they can't operate in their own office without everybody else hearing what's going on. So I certainly support putting the buildings together in the same location, connecting water and sewer from Newburyport, and just making a very nice and something of character that the town can be proud of. This, this all runs to the character of the town. And if you want to have an old town, continue what you have. If you want a, a town that's moving forward, put on a new station and a new uh, town hall. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, and pose to Mike Doyle first. If you're elected to office, what are your top three priorities for the Board of Select? Uh, the top three priorities, number one, and it's two, two major projects on the table. It's, we've just talked about the police station. The second project is Triton Stadium has been condemned. And as a town, we are, we're going to have to deal with that. It's uh, the, this field, I've been uh, subbing it out of Triton. The field is deplorable, the track is deplorable, and now the, the, the building commission had just uh, condemned the stands this past year. The second option that I think is the most important for the town, I'd like to see the town form a committee of new residents current build, current committee members, and we start exploring the different ways we can get business in this town. Um, I'm looking at, we have three basic areas. We have one in Byfield, we have one in Old Town, and we have some areas down here in Plum Island that can be developed. We have to develop, to, to, to develop anything, we need water. I would like to look towards not just Newport, Byfield, and also Raleigh. New, Raleigh's developed a lot of in the industry in Route 1, and I think if we start looking to Raleigh for water, that may be an answer um, for, uh, for one of the biggest problems. But the town has voted no to free override. I take the town's vote, as, I hear the vote. So if we say no, we have to get revenue elsewhere. The revenue is going to come to business. We have to become business friendly and open this town up to business somewhere. The third thing that I'd like to see, I'd like to see lifeguards back in the island. From Island, okay, we had the lifeguards taken away a few years ago, and somebody that comes to the island all the time, I, I just see a huge liability, number one, for the, the number of people who come down here. Number two, I think the, the lifeguards could also be a, the eyes and ears for the police station, for the police department, and like they could basically help keep things in order, but I think that's a priority we have to get back on the board. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next, uh, George Morris. Uh, yes, we've already talked about municipal facilities improvement with the police station and fire station. That's on the top of my list also, and so I don't have to spend much time on that. The uh, next item I would like to bring up as a priority is somehow to improve communications between the Board of Selectmen and the town generally with the citizens. Uh, things are going on all the time, emergency matters, not emergency matters, and just ongoing considerations for the town, and no one seems to know what's happening. Uh, you have the newspaper report some items, the television report some items, but for the most part, people aren't getting the information. And when it comes time for town meeting, when we have to have serious considerations and votes taken, people come in, those who do come, they're really uneducated about what's going to happen. And I would like to see them know more. I'd like to see citizens coming in to say, I know what we're talking about tonight. I'm very, very concerned and I'm for or against but at least it's an educated position that they take. The other thing, I, at that point, I would like to see more people come to town meeting because when you go and you barely have a quorum, it's difficult to conduct business, and you always have to wonder why are 100 people there when so many more can be there. I'd like to see 1,000 people there, but it probably will never happen. Uh, the, the third thing, and of interest to the island, and it's sort of at least in my mind, seriously, to be considered, is uh, sea level rise. Uh, at this point in time, you don't think too much about it, but pretty soon, the town will be very concerned about sea level rise, the island in particular. Uh, 
towns on the south shore, situate uh, Duxbury and Mansfield, have gotten together and had a study done with a grant, and they've looked at sea level rise 25 years out from now and 75 years. And the results that are shown from that study are surprising, and Newbury would be very much affected by it. So it seems to be the time to get together with two other towns, Salisbury and uh, Raleigh together, with us to come up with some type of study that shows us what's going to happen and begin to plan for it now rather than plan for it when it's on us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jay Arnold. My top three priorities basically revolve around having a plan. <clears throat> Any successful venture has a plan. Um, number one, I think we need to protect homes and <clears throat> businesses' property values by properly citing both. And um, I've seen businesses trying to get permitted in the proper places in industrial zones and to get through, run through the ringer over things like landscape plans, frag mining control, and just frankly minutia. We need to speed the permitting process for businesses that are properly located. Also protecting homeowners' property values by keeping businesses where they belong, large businesses. It's going to keep people's homes from being devalued. It's your single largest investment for most of us, especially us younger families in town. And I'm seeing too many instances where selectmen are ready to just throw a few residents under the bus to lay in some type of big commercial development. And I don't think it's right. We shouldn't pick and choose who goes under the wheels to make a quick buck. Um, secondly, I think preserving the character of the town is our best long-term plan. It's, uh, it'll be a good investment to keep the town orderly, and it's going to make it desirable to people that want to buy homes here and people that want to start businesses here. We should support new businesses that are correctly cited and people that want to make renovations and additions to their home. It's a good investment in the long run. Thirdly, I want to update the master plan and make sure it is referred to while we're making decisions. A lot of intelligent people put a lot of time into forming Newbury's master plan. And it's just up on a shelf somewhere. It's, to me, everything we need to know just about is in the plan. The plan's due for an update. I want to make sure that the right people are in place to update the plan. And I want to make sure we refer to it when we're making decisions that affect all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with George Morse. And the question is, what qualities or experience makes you the best qualified candidate for selection? As I went over with you in my opening statement, uh, I am an attorney with several years of experience, over 30. Uh, during that time, I also qualified as a certified financial planner, so I have some financial background, and I served as a, board, a director on the board of directors of a bank, uh, which was a local bank for several years before that bank was acquired by a major Boston institution. Uh, in the service and, and after the service, I've been in a position of leadership positions uh, in my firm in particular. Uh, and that went on for several years as I was here and, uh, leading several people. I'm relatively new to the town, but I bring a clean slate, and I think the ability to sit back and look and see what's going on with where the action ought to be taken and what selectmen ought to do. Thank you. Okay. Next is uh, J.R. Colby. I feel I'm well qualified for the job because I'm 34 years old. I have a young family and family. I'm fully invested in Newbury. My family, my home, and my business are here. I'm the only candidate that's currently not a town hall insider, and I don't owe anybody any favors. I'm easy to find and approachable. I'm a farmer. I'm constantly going up and down the roads. You can find me at the farm on Scotland Road. I'm easy to locate. Also, I'm an independent thinker. I won't be told what to do, and I can't be bought. Money, frankly, is not that important to me. It's more important to do the right thing. I'm a listener and a team player, and I'm not afraid to ask a stupid question if I don't know the answer. I'm not quick to make a knee-jerk reaction to a quick cash offer like we're starting to see in town. And I'm not afraid to take an unpopular stance on an issue if I feel I'm right or if a group of citizens feels they're right and my track record shows that. I rarely vacation 
I'm pretty much always around. I can make the meetings. There won't be excuses or trips here and trips there. I can make the meetings so we can make a quota and get business done. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Mike Doyle. Um, like I said in my opening statements, I'm committed to the town. I've been, I've, I've been a former selectman. I served on the Board of Health. Um, I currently serve on the new rebuilding committee. One thing I noticed is that my last time, the town, what you need for this job is time. Um, the job request acquires a great, great amount of time. That's why I stepped down 10 to 12 years ago. I worked full time then. I no longer work full time. I now have the time to give to the town which it needs. Um, but other than that, like I said, Doug, I, I said earlier, the do job has changed so much. I think it's time it, it's the selectmen get out and get the pulse of what people want and in basically communications. This one, Dave Mountain, is really going to be missed. He brought to this town the new channel. He, he, that was his endeavor. And that has been such a, a huge endeavor as far as getting people that can't make it to meetings to let them know what's going on in the town. Even the, even the, the town meeting, George said, it's, it's an embarrassment sometimes how many people show up. But if, if at least if you're informed with the newbie channel and see what's going on, you then can go to a town meeting and make a, a rational decision. So that's why I'm, I feel I'm qualified for the job. Okay, thank you. Next question, we'll start with J.R. Colby. In recent years, we've seen significant commercial growth in the neighboring communities of Raleigh and Newburyport. Newbury is lagging behind. Do you think that Newbury should expand its commercial base? And if so, where should the expansion occur? I don't know if we should necessarily expand our commercial zones. We do have commercial zones to work with. They're not as numerous as other towns, but we do have them. I think we should do everything we can to continue and foster the growth of commercial businesses along Route 1. And we also have another business industrial zone that's bounded by a short piece of Scotland Road, Highfield Road, and Middle Road, and Parker Street. Um, perfect place for business. It's where the Middle Road solar site was just sited. Perfect place for it. Um, we also have a small business industrial district in Byfield, right in the center, you know, near the Pearson Plaza area. And also we have a small commercial area near the Parker River Bridge. Uh, we need to do everything to speed permitting and work with these businesses that are trying to be in the correct place in town, rather than running them through the ringer or running them right up to the moment where their purchase and sales agreement is about to expire, because this has been happening in town. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Mike Doyle. Um, Kathleen Pearson and the Planning Board did a study on what water and sewage or some combination thereof would bring to the Route 1 area of Newbury. And the money, the dollars are incredible. It's like we have to develop this area. Raleigh has developed it, and it's time for Newbury to step forward and start developing, looking at all options. That's why I like to put a good committee together to look at this. Uh, it's time that we have to find more sources of revenue. There's a lot we got to have, have on our table that we have to deal with, and it's going to cost money, and if people don't want to do it by our taxes, we have to do it the other way, and that's business. And we have to be pro-business in this town and start dealing with it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, George Morris. Yeah. As a member of the planning board, the planning board has reviewed the Route 1 corridor, uh, which is a light business and light industrial district. Uh, without water and sewer, we're in a difficult position to bring new business in, but we also want to approach the owners in the area to see if they want to sell it or rent, if they have an interest in doing that, because we can encourage businesses to come in that are not water intensive and not personal intensive, it's, but good businesses. Uh, I think the main thing is, is to look for those people who would like to come in on a static type of operation, uh, which would be attractive, make that area look much better than it is now, and uh, frankly make the town, one of the gateways in the town look a lot better. Uh, I would like to see the commercial zones also used and developed better than they are now, but again, that depends on the owners. Uh, the Pearson Plaza area was expanded as far as a business district as a commercial zone. Uh, it would be nice to see that used as some type of uh, retail facility of some significance. Whether that ever happens, I don't know, but that's up to the honest and that's up to people who want to come in. So if there's much that can be done, we do need water, we do need sewer, uh, then we can become much more active in the business zone on Route 1. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Mike Doyle. What lessons should Newbury learn from the recent debate over building a solar farm on Middle Road? Do you have suggestions for new guidelines that should be put in place? The town uh, dealt mm -hmm. basically set new south solar bylaws, and I think we should follow those bylaws. That being said, I think the town missed a big opportunity uh, a year and a half ago with the option of Scotland Road. In a time where the town has voted no to overrides, we had an option to bring in a, a facility that was up to $800,000 in tax dollars over 20 years. I know there were concerns about the common pasture, but you can pick up a solar farm in, in 20 years and the common pasture is still there. We're not destroying the land, you're not putting foundations in, and it's a clean source of energy. I think it's a win-win for this town. I think we should have done it. Okay, thank you. George Morris? Many people have said they really don't want solar installations in town, but as a practical matter, the state and its laws have said uh, that we cannot prohibit them. And we can prohibit them in a sense in some areas, but we have to allow areas when, where a facility can actually be placed. And in doing so, that's primarily in the agricultural district, which is also residential. And there's some in the commercial districts, but there's not much space left. Along Route 1, we're pinched by marshes. And by doing that, large pieces of land to support a solar array are just not there. So we are looking at as farms, uh, as are, has already been done, some portion of the commercial district. But the big pieces of land are going away except for the farming area. And that would bother a lot of people. So wherever you put one, somebody has resistance either because they live nearby or it may affect their property in the future for development. And I think if we have to follow the bylaw, that's the way we ought to handle it. Uh, I was involved in the drafting of the bylaw. It's a good bylaw. And I think in the future we can get some uh, solar arrays that would make sense for the town and provide some income and some a good development is quiet. They're good neighbors, and they really won't bother anybody at all. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, All right, since the question was about Middle Road, I'm going to stop with that. Middle Road solar array on the Nichols property was correctly cited, and that's why it was quickly approved. It wasn't contested because it's in a business industrial zone. There are no nearby homes. It's uh, the site, when I was a kid, we had a field down the railroad bed on the Beagle Club's side of the railroad tracks. We used to have to push the trash that was dumped out of the way with a tractor to get to the field. It's very contaminated when the railroad went through, all the cinders, the oil, everything went right out the door. It's a contaminated area. It's a perfect place to uh, site a solo home. Um, the abutters were notified. I remember at least one gentleman showed up. He asked a few questions. Nobody contested the solar away, and it was approved. Correct decision. Um, Scotland Road, a different story. The array at the Pipe Farm on Scotland Road was sited completely on BVW wetlands. And what that means, bordering vegetated wetlands, it means where groundwater discharges to the surface, or there's areas of heavy runoff into a body of water. That body of water will be a little river. It's also the habitat of two globally rare species. The American bittern, which is a wetlands bird, very rare to see and also Long's Bulrush, which is a very rare wetlands plant. And they do exist out there, I can tell you from personal experience. Um, the array was sited on the bank of Little River. It's in a known floodplain. In the Mother's Day storm of 06, the Parker River would have been envious of the Little River. Um, ultimately, DEP stopped the project because it was environmentally harmful. Nobody else did. The, uh, the Abadas were all told there was nothing that could be done. Ultimately, DEP killed that project, and it was the right decision. The thing to remember about solar arrays, a 15-acre solar array over 20 years is not going to provide any more tax revenue than 10 homes will, and that is before excise tax on the vehicles at those homes. They create no local jobs after construction. And they are also remotely monitored. Monitoring is not going to be a local job. Um, during the array that I was more directly involved with, I heard many things, you know, like George said, you can't rule against it. You can't say no. There's nothing we can do for you. Well, a couple of selectmen stood up and at least attempted to protect 
the residents of Scotland. Um, would it have held up in court? I don't know. But they had the guts to do it, and everybody should be envious of them for that. It's, to me, it is not okay for the selectmen to throw residents under the bus and put something like this behind their homes, next to their homes. It's 15 acres of plastic glass. This traces of cadmium, and lead, and mercury, and solar panels. Um, they are zero emissions, but they buzz and hum like high tension power lines. And the humming comes from DC to AC converting equipment. And they hum in the morning and at night, even more so in hot weather. And um, I don't think anyone would want to be put next to one of these things any more than they would want to be put next to a cell phone tower. And if you say it does not devalue these people's homes, I don't know how you can say that with a straight face. It, they do not belong in a residential area. Thank you. Okay, next question, we're gonna start with George Morse. What is your position on restoring services to Plum Island? Lifeguards, bathroom facilities, and public trash removal. How would you pay for it if the services, if these are services you support? These were services that existed well before the economy went south. And because of the lack of revenue in the town and costs that were going up, it was very difficult to remain many different services in town, keeping different services in town, including the lifeguards and trash removal and so on on the beach. Um, I would love to see them restored. The problem is, is how do you pay for them? Uh, do we have user fees? That's not practical, I don't think. Uh, because of the volume of people who come in, you can't really enforce user fees. So as time improves, if we, our economy improves, perhaps, one or more of those can be brought back to the beach, provided we don't uh, impinge on other essential services. Uh, I think that the uh, concern is the ultimate annual cost of what this would be compared to what essential services cost. Uh, we have a roughly a 17 to $18 million budget in town. 55% of that goes to schools. So that leaves less than uh, about eight and a half million dollars to run the entire town. So where do you take the money and put it in one place or the other? It's just the selectmen have to work in that and follow the budget as approved by the uh, town meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up, J.R. Coley. To me, the services on Plum Island to restore them, it's gonna take an over and it would be a good opportunity for the citizens of Plum Island to help educate the rest of the town on why an override was necessary. Um, through rejecting overrides, residents have shown that they don't consider these priority units. Um, that's unfortunate. And everyone concerned needs to get together and try to educate folks why such a small override can restore these services and make this town a lot, place to, a lot nicer to live in and a lot nicer to visit. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up, Mike Doyle. Um, like I've already stated, lifeguards, I think, are, are an option. It's a must. As far as public trash, the town doesn't have public trash. Um, but I think we should have maybe the, at the center where it's not, it's, it's, it's basically a, a, an area of the dumping on the ball of people on the beach. That should be picked up by the DPT. Okay, uh, how we pay for it? I start looking at things as we have a parking fee, we'll be paying out $20, increase that fee, um, the beach parking. People, a lot of people on the beach have, uh, they, they rent their, uh, their lots out to park on it. Maybe there's a way we can tax them, okay, so we can get some of the income from that. Um, but it, I think, as far as life goes, it's not that much money, and I think we have to find a way to get it back in the budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question, we are going to start with Jared Colby. How does beach erosion impact Newbury, and what should the Board of Selectmen do to address it? Uh, beach erosion directly affect, affects Newbury, first of all, in lost tax dollars. Every inch of property you lose to the ocean in every dwelling, our revenue goes down. Um, when I come back to, we need a plan. Plum Island needs a plan. Um, the Mass Coastal Erosion Commission they're taking serious steps to come up with a plan. It's controversial. I know there's a fear of a building ban on Plum Island. I would not agree with that. Perhaps only in the most 
um, in the most intense erosion areas. But what we need to do is follow the guidelines and advice from the Mass Coastal Erosion Commission when they complete. Um, I'd like to see us be more open to new and diversified erosion control tactics. There's a ton of ideas out there. Talking to people at the farm, customers from Plum, Plum Island, I mean, it ranges from beach scraping to fences to jetties to stone behind their homes. Somehow we need to come up with a test platform to try different things and see for ourselves what's working. Um, also, a simple thing we can do because the residents of Plum Island are the experts. We need to support Peter's efforts to continue brainstorming and communicating. One thing I like is um, by repairing the entryways to all the beaches, we're going to have points to measure from so we can measure the onset of the erosion as it's occurring. Thank you. Okay. Next up, uh, Mike Doyle. Okay, on February 23rd, 2015, I came to this hall and attended the Merrimack River Beach Alliance meeting. At that point, they discussed the state's coastal storm report. It's most important that we, on March 9th that people from this area go to Ipswich and put your input on that report. Okay, if you have, a, if you disagree with something important, now is your time to do it. Okay, uh, as far as the island itself is concerned, I was slugging when the DEP put water and sewage down here. Okay, when that happened, all bets are off the table. We have to protect the homes that, they, and it, also we have to protect that system. It's a multi-million dollar system that needs protection. And I, I, I commend the people that put the, the walls up and stuff. But the bottom line, it has to be done as a group effort. Because one area where the wall stopped, the erosion, the wave action went in and almost dug into an area where the house was lost, and then we almost lost the septic system there. We have to do it as a, 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 a group effort. So if we do one thing, it goes all the way down the island but I am in favor of, of, of all protection of the island. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, George Morse. Uh, yes, on the Plum Island, people who live here know more than anyone else that the barrier island is constantly changing. One pebble of sand doesn't stay in the same place forever. And beach erosion is caused by even light currents, but when angry, uh, angry ocean and angry winds and strong tidal currents get together. The impact of this island is magnificent, but in this terrifying way. Uh, I think that the town and the selectmen can continue working to work with the state and with even federal authorities and be active in the Merrimack River Beach Alliance program so that this constant effort to develop new technology, uh, to follow what new things can be done, uh, to help protect the island residents out here from losing properties in whatever way we can by technology, uh, to protect our tax base to a very great degree, and anything that we can do as a group with other towns would be most useful. Newbury alone can't do it. Uh, maybe three or four towns can't do it, but a group along the shoreline from Boston to uh, Salisbury can get together and have a lot of impact on what can be done for protection. Okay. We're getting near the end of the questions, and I just wanted to remind everybody, if you have a question you want to pose, all right, here we go. Let me know. Thank you. Okay. If anybody has questions, uh, as I mentioned, we've got a piece of paper over there, pencils. Just bring them on up. Okay, next question. We'll start with Mike Doyle. Uh, what is your view of the Merrimack River Beach Alliance and the work it has done to accomplish today? Okay, I've been in multiple <coughs> meetings on okay, this alliance. They've done an amazing job as far as boost time in, 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 in the, at the current selectmen and at current state reps and the past state reps. They've done a great job of, of looking out of what the problem is. We've got that, we have everyone comes to the meetings. This comes down here, we have state reps. We have state um, uh, engineers. We discussed the, uh, the jetties and the, and the problems there. We discussed the erosion factor. We discussed sea level rises. And that's why I, I said my last statement. It's like in, my, in two, two or three weeks, there's a meeting in Ipswich. And like I said, people can have their input. They have time to read the report, okay? And put your input in as what, what, what's happening there. This is this group it meets every six to eight weeks down here, and it's it, they do amazing work. 
Uh, it's not just the island, they're looking at the whole coast of Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. George? What else can I say? Uh, I said in my last uh, comment, last question, that the Alliance is one of the most important things that we have in this area as far as lobbying and working with people to help protect property and to preserve property values. Uh, the people who dedicate their time for that, their time is invaluable. Uh, their interest in doing it is very important. And they help come up with solutions and push new technology and particularly get other organizations involved or to produce a uh, combined alliance against uh, resistance to do anything at all. So I think as long as they continue working hard and expand, uh, this great opportunity and great prospect for making progress and helping save the island. Thank you. Thank you. J.R. Cole. I think the Alliance has done the right things, and um, I can equate it to a little bit of my own experience. When the solar array was proposed for Scotland Road, and I saw some obvious problems, I sought the advice of an old, older gen gentleman in my neighborhood who was involved heavily in town government. I said, what do I do? And he says, the first thing you have to do is make some noise. And that is what the Alliance has done. Um, the second thing you've got to do is either be vocal or find a vocal mouthpiece. Um, Ron Barrett, he's a lightning rod. Love him, hate him, the man has something to say, and you have to respect that. Bringing together groups and individuals that wouldn't normally communicate directly. Big. That's what happened on Scotland Road to stop the destructive project, and that is what they're doing here. And you can see by the speed at which things are getting done. I mean, hurdles that can take months are taking weeks instead. Um, they're trying to utilize intelligent local people, use the assets we have here. There are a lot of great mines in Newbury and Byfield, and um, it's such a great resource. I'd also like to commend Senator Tata for acknowledging the efforts of the people of Plum Island and taking a direct role in leading and also being a vocal mouthpiece um, in places that our voices could never normally reach. Thank you. Thank you. We have one question from the audience, and we'll start with George Morse on this question. The question is, what is your position on industrial and commercial placed in a zoned residential area? I want to understand the question. Is the question asking, can you put a development of industrial uh, uh, buildings or operations in a residential area, or do you want to expand that? I, I can explain. Um, I would like to know what your position is when, um, in particular, the solar arrays, mm -hmm. they're going to place a commercial industrial insta insta installation on the Main Street property in a zoned residential agricultural area. Um, I'd like to know what your position is on, on that, how you feel about zone putting in those type of huge power plant in abiding homes. Okay, I understand what you're saying. One of the few places in town that can actually handle an array right now is the residential and agricultural zone. Again, we can't permit it, uh, prohibit them, but I think we can work with the applicants to try to protect the residents' position as much as possible. Uh, to protect from sound and, and sight by uh, shielding both the uh, plants and also shielding the homes by trees and so on so that they don't see them. They, it's just as if they aren't there. Uh, it's a tough position to take, but the state really can't, can't turn around and say, we prohibit you. Uh, they, they say that we can't prohibit you, and we can't stop it that way. There's so few places that we can put them. I have to ask you, where else can we put them? You put them, you, no, no, you could put them, you could put them on Brownfield, you could put them, um, you, you do not need to um, destroy uh, Greenfield. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm no, that's okay. we're so, not debating. No, yeah, no, no, the no, asked me a question, I asked and I can respond. So that's, uh, Mike, I want to know, how, how do you, how do you feel about placing, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're trying to, <laughs> just so we go across, so everybody gets a chance to answer you here. Uh, J.R., you're next. I think everyone knows how I feel about it. Large business, I don't feel belongs in a residential area. It kills the neighbor's property values. We have places for these activities. The reasons they're getting forced into other places, you know, they're cheap buys, wet areas. Um, 
it's an industry right now, these are large scale arrays that we've been seeing. It's funded with our tax money. They're being forced in by state mandates and they're destroying neighborhoods. That's how I feel about it. I can't support it. Mike? The town has to make some decisions, okay? Everyone, every one of them is gonna be looked at with a face value. You're gonna look at what George said. If it's legal, okay, and we have to have, a, if we're gonna fight it, with what grounds we have to fight on it. Um, number one. Number two, we need, well, the towns are donor taxes. Where are we gonna get money? We have to start being pro business in this town. Um, and like I said, I respect, okay, you have your property values. Okay, I'm not saying to put it next door to you. But, but like, that's where it's going, Mike. Like I said, I, have to, I, I told you last night at the meeting, I, have to, I haven't looked at your particular project yet because it hasn't come to the state. It was supposed to be at the meeting last night, that's always at the meeting last night. We have to look at each, one, each individual project, okay, with its merits and its, and, its, and its problems, okay? From that point, we make rash decisions. Are there any other questions? Does anybody have any questions they wanted to pose? Can you touch on the stadium project? Huh? Stadium project? Can you touch on that? Yeah, yeah. we can share. That's a great topic. That's a great topic. <coughs> uh, let's start with. Let's see, George was. Uh, no, Mike was last. Right. Okay. Oh, the system. Was the question? Okay, let's. Well, let's come up with a question. How do you feel about the uh, stadium project? Why would you be funded? Stadium. The Triton Stadium. The Triton Stadium project. <laughs> what are your feelings on this? What, what's that? Sure. Okay. Like I said, I've been out of Triton on a, a number of days in the last this, this year. The stadium is a it's been condemned. Uh, as, a, as a town, we have a responsibility of the other two towns to, to deal with this. That being said, we have another issue. Okay, with Triton. Okay, the budget just came out. In the recommendation of the budget, it's going to be four percent short. So the, they, they're already cutting core values in the, in the school. It's like, we have to look at this problem and not re react, okay, we, the Triton Stadium should have been taken care of over the years. If we build it again, we have to maintain it. That's why the Capital Planning Committee in this town has done a great job. You look out on a problem, and instead of not taking care of it and having it fall on it, you maintain, 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 so it doesn't get condemned. So yes, we have to deal with it because, shame on us, we've let it condemn. Mm -hmm. George, you want to take that on? Uh, yes, the uh, three towns have an obligation to provide a good educational opportunity for the, the children in a safe and secure environment. And that includes safe facilities for athletics. And apparently people want to have the uh, Triton Regional School involved heavily in athletics because, because we have good football pro programs and other programs. Uh, that requires competence on the part of the school system that we will back these facilities and, and let them do what they do best, and that's to educate and provide a healthy environment for the kids. Thank you. Okay. The grandstands were in tough shape at Triton in the 90s when I attended. The, uh, the visitor stands had already been closed. Uh, we need to do something about the Triton Stadium. Basically what I think, there's been talk about AstroTurf, concession stands, covered entryways. I think a little of it is excessive. Um, I support replacing the bleachers. We have to. They're steel, very light duty. I don't even know how they're still standing at this point being next to the salt marsh. Um, lighting was an issue then. We really need to do something about the lighting. Um, as far as AstroTurf, a complete dig up and redo. I don't think this is the AstroTurf kind of town. This is a grass and dirt kind of town. That's a traditional playing surface at Triton, and it should continue to be. You come here to play in the dirt. Um, it's, it's something we have to do, but we can do it conservatively. AstroTurf isn't going to last forever. Um, I have an idea what I could receive that football field for. I could probably do it for under a thousand bucks. Um, the track is in tough shape. We need to repave the track. One smart thing we could do is to put in conduits for future improvements. If we have an idea, maybe someday we could do a concession stand. When we redo the track, maybe we can run some conduits through so there's, we can pull wires and things at a later date. That would be a smart thing that we could do now without spending a ton of money. So I guess basically in a nutshell, I support a no frills repair of the Triton Stadium. Okay, great. We're all done with our questions.
questions. Oh, we have another question. Jack, just, just on some financial matters. You read just gone through probably three or four years of financial challenges, and we're just starting to get back to uh, a water level of restoring service with it and up. We are now faced with, we know we have $2.5 million worth of unfunded capital improvements for our school and for our library. Town Hall needs a minimum of sewer system, approximately $700,000. Our police station is in deplorable conditions. And we've got a range of pricing from four to eight million dollars. I'd like to hear from the candidates, how would you go forward in funding these uh, particular no needs, uh, whether it be override, debt exclusion, or some other uh, creative funding mechanism? Right, who would like to start? George, we're technically in your end. Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. On the uh, stadium and on the police station the town hall complex, I would think that a debt exclusion override would be the best way to do it. A debt exclusion override is a, an override I like the common one that lasts forever. Uh, as soon as the debt is paid off, the override disappears. And that's been a common way of doing it in this town and other towns for years. Uh, the town has a decent credit rating, and we have the ability to get the bonding, and it's the best way to spread out the cost over a period of time. Uh, as far as lesser uh, projects, we may be, have to other overrides a common type, and we have to come to town meeting and, they, and the electorate and say, we need this money, you have to understand that we need this money, and please vote for it. Otherwise, we don't move forward. I think it's important that we do. Yeah. The only way to do it, unfortunately, is with an override. It's going to take some time to expand our tax base. These needs are pressing in there now. Um, through talking with people, I understand that while well, other towns have increased taxes little by little over the years, there have been periods of time when Newbury hasn't increased taxes at all. And what it's allowed us to do is fall behind. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I hate paying taxes. I hate more. We have a young family. Um, we do all kinds of crazy stuff to survive. But um, I feel like the town infrastructure was in good shape for our predecessors, and it should be in good shape for our children. Um, through inflation and everything else, um, we just have to give a little more. We have to. Um, because you know services and facilities, they're going away, they're falling apart. It's you know basically it's a it's a tough truth, but we got to dig a little deeper. It, there's really no way around it. As far as an override going away, I'd have to get a guarantee on that one. It doesn't seem like tolls, taxes, nothing ever goes away. But we need to work together to find a rate, even if it's just a little bit. It doesn't have to be a lot. It can be a little. We can make these decisions if people turn out to these meetings because right now like the new town hall the stadium these decisions are being made the stuff's going forward in front of a crowd of like one two three or five people and the problem is when you catch it on the newbury channel days later it's too late the decisions are made um everyone has to get out now um i feel you know i the truth is i feel like we all need to give just a little bit more but um, we all need to get involved, so it's a controlled decision. It's a decision we can all live with. Thank you. Thanks. Mike? Uh, debt exclusion is the way to go. Uh, we, we, the state lives under Proposition 2 and a half regulations, so we have to deal with it. We, got, we have some major issues coming off the books on the understanding Newbury, and it's time with the interest rates low, a debt exclusion over is the way to fund these right now. And like I said, my hat's off to the capital planning, because they are now, instead of re reacting, to something happening like we are now, they're planning for the future 20 years. They're doing 20 year uh, plans so we don't have to deal with this problem. Okay, thanks. All right, we are now moving to the final stage here, which is the closing statements from the candidates. And we're going to go into reverse order of what we started. So that means, George Morse, you start. I would like to think that experience in the law and finances would help me bring to the table. Uh, some valuable experience that would be helpful to the uh, progress of the town going forward, help with the weather selectmen, help with the other boards and committees. 
And really all I want to say is that I have the better, best interest of town at heart. I want to help bring it forward in the future, and I want to serve everybody in the community well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next, Mike Doyle. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Pitta, the Palm Island Foundation, and News for bringing this together. <clears throat> uh, this is an important election. David Mountain did a lot for this town, and to fill his shoes is not going to be easy. Uh, the town right now, it's we have a, a, major, a lot of major things to deal with, and I think one thing I bring to the thing is experience that I've had in the town government, and also I have the time. It's like if you talk to the current selectmen, time is a major issue, okay, and I have that time to get now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and J.R. Colby. I don't have a lot of fancy degrees, but, um, and I can't tell you about all the things I've done, but I can tell you what I'm doing now. I'm maintaining a home, a family, and a business in Newbury in today's conditions. Um, you want to talk about experience, age? Experience is what has got us here. I think we need a breath of fresh air in town hall. Listening to residents, it's such a thing, listening. When I've approached Lechman in the past, uh, twice I got met basically with a hand in my face and I didn't appreciate it. You should listen to the residents. I want to be a resident selectman. If you come to me with a problem, a neighborhood, I'm not the budget guy, I'm not the town hall guy. I want to be the residence guy. Um, I'm very stubborn. I won't be told to do, and I can't be bought. I'm also a conservative spender. I think as you've seen a little bit tonight, um, I don't like all the bells and whistles on everything. I just, a sound machine that does the job, that's what we want. And uh, if you want a straight shooter, that'll listen to you. I'm your man, thank you. Great. All right, well, on behalf of the Plum Island Foundation and the Plum Island Taxpayers and Associates, I'd like to thank the candidates for taking part in this.